Hello everyone. So today we are going to talk about how single cell RNA sequencing data is visualized in two dimensions using the algorithm which is known as uh, T-SNE or uh, so the full name of the algorithm is T-Distributed Stochastic Neighborhood Embedding but uh, most popularly it is known as T-SNE. So in fact uh, it is actually very widely used so most of the single cell RNA sequencing paper that you uh, see nowadays uh, or at least uh, uh, some of the earlier papers they mostly resorted to using T-SNE for visualizing the uh, data sets in 2D. So as you know that uh, the single cell sequencing data uh, these are very high dimensional data sets and um, T-SNE was the go to method for visualizing these data sets in 2D. Uh, of course, later on another method became very popular which is known as UMAP, but uh, so as of now both of these methods are very very popular and uh, nowadays most of the papers are also uh, utilizing UMAP instead of TSNE, but TSNE has also remained uh, as a more popular dimension reduction and visualization technique for um, single cell RNA sequencing data. And in fact, a very recent study actually showed that with careful uh, parameter tuning with TSNE, TSNE can also perform um, uh, equivalent or in some cases better than UMAP. So TSNE and UMAP, both of these are like the most prominent uh, visualization technique uh, when it comes to single cell RNA sequencing data. And in this particular slide, you can also see data sets of different sizes have been uh, visualized in uh, 2D using this TSNE method. Now again this particular data set contains 25,000 cells where this is uh, the number of cells used for uh, actually developing the mouse atlas of cells where it used around 400,000 cells and in this particular um, example actually 2 million cells were are being visualized using 2D you know, with, uh, uh, with the help of this uh, TSNE algorithm. So what is sort of uh, the general idea for TSNE, right? So again, it is uh, actually a nonlinear dimension reduction method and uh, the most prominent usage of TSNE is to uh, visualize the data in 2D because when you use TSNE, you, ba you are basically uh, trying to reduce the data dimension of the data set to 2D and which is actually very useful for exploration or visualization of the data. And you see this spherical structure, this blob-like structure. So essentially, TSNE has a very different uh, uh, flavor of reducing the dimension. So instead of like uh, trying to identify the manifold structure or trying to uh, sort of capture the neighborhood relationship for the cells, uh, TSNE can actually capture uh, or identify the hidden cluster structure in the data. So ideally, if TSNE is able to embed the data uh, perfectly, then uh, close neighbors, uh, the neighbors who are very close in the high dimensional data, they should also remain close in the lower dimensional structure. And uh, the distant points uh, should remain distant. So essentially that is the idea for TSNE is that it can identify some of the cluster structure which is hidden in the data. So, here in this particular slide, you are seeing a comparison of TSNE against uh, two other linear dimension reduction techniques, MDA and uh, principal component analysis. So effectively, again, the general hope is that uh, TSNE can bring out the cluster structure much better than MDS or PCA. So here you see that is what is happening uh, for this particular example. So again, this is a particular single cell RNA sequencing data set where uh, this uh, uh, multidimensional scaling or the PCA, they are not really bringing out the cluster structure as evidently as uh, TSNE. So when you look at the 2D plot for TSNE, it is actually separating out the clusters into different groups much better as compared to this uh, PCA or MDS method. So, but there is also a caveat with uh, uh, this particular result that TSNE is getting. So it turns out that uh, even though it is actually preserving the local structure, local cluster structure of the data, the global geometry is somewhat uh, misrepresented um, when TSNE is actually 
plotting them plotting the cells in 2d so in fact you see some numbers being represented over here and in this paper um, they actually looked at some of the measures for how global geometry is preserved uh, and how the local geometry is preserved and in case of Tisney versus PCA. So this KNN metric, this is a metric for uh, quantifying how much of the local structure is preserved by the algorithm. So it turned out that the, in terms of preserving the local structure, Tisney was doing much better than uh, PCA. Of course, this value is much higher than that of PCA, but the two other metrics, these metrics are actually accounting for uh, how much of the global structure is preserved by the algorithm. You see here um, in terms of the uh, these two metrics, TSNI was performing worse as compared to PC, at least in terms of the last uh, metric over here. So even though TSNI is actually able to find this uh, different uh, hidden cluster structure in the data, it is doing it at the cost of uh, losing some of the properties of the data, some specific properties of the data. And in fact, we are going to see that in details when we talk about how to interpret the results of TSNI. So, uh, but uh, in a certain uh, subsequent study with single cell RNA sequencing data, people actually showed that uh, with careful parameter tuning, these metrics can also be improved for TSNI. So in fact, uh, this is actually the result of the default TSNI with uh, default values of the parameters, but with uh, some uh, parameter tuning, TSNI can also achieve better score for these two other metrics, which are actually looking for the preservation of the global structure. So let's talk about the algorithm uh, informally first. So essentially, the goal of uh, TSNI is to place all the points on the 2D plane. Again, we are projecting everything onto two-dimensional space. And um, uh, most uh, common practice is to initially place them at random positions. And then uh, it basically treats them as uh, physical particles which are interacting with, it, it, uh, with each other. So this uh, sort of interaction is actually governed by two laws. So the first law is saying that all of these points are actually repelled from each other. But at the same time, each of these points are also attracted to its uh, nearest neighbor in the high dimensional data point. So essentially you see that there is a combination of attractive and repulsive forces that are interacting between all the points and that finally helps in finding this uh, or preserving this local structure. So we are going to see that in more details. Okay. And one of the most important parameter of TSNI is known as uh, perplexity. So this perplexity parameter is um, it actually controls the computation of the similarities uh, between the points. So we are going to see that in case of TSNI, we are going to compute similarity between points both in the high dimensional and low dimensional space. And this computation of similarities like this, this quantification will be governed by this perplexity parameter. And essentially, uh, that's how this perplexity parameter is also governing the number of nearest neighbors of a particular point or a particular cell. So this uh, number of nearest neighbors uh, uh, for each of these points, it is also um, sort of like uh, governed by or controlled by this perplexity parameter. Now, as I said earlier, like uh, even after doing uh, or even after preserving the cluster structure in the 2D plane, TSNI is actually failing to preserve the global geometry of the data. So now we are going to take a look at uh, TSNI more formally. Okay, so before uh, going for the formal idea, let's talk about the overall steps in the algorithm. And in fact, right now we are going to describe an algorithm which was the original algorithm before TSNI. So this is known as uh, stochastic neighborhood embedding. TSNI just uh, uh, slightly modified the idea of the SNE algorithm that is the stochastic neighborhood embedding algorithm uh, by some change by uh, coming up with some changes in the distributional assumptions and all to come up with the final T SNE algorithm. So let us look at look at the overall idea of the algorithm. So essentially we have a very high dimensional data a data set uh, with an dimensionality capital D. So essentially all the points or the cells are uh, actually present in the high dimensional space uh, given as RD. 
and the goal is to embed them into the 2D plane uh, for visualization. So that is the fine uh, goal of the algorithm itself. And in order to do that, the algorithm first actually defines a similarity function, which is uh, uh, given by this p i to j, and uh, this similarity function is defined on the input space. And as you can also see that this is uh, actually a non-symmetric similarity function. And in this case, it is actually using a Gaussian kernel. So effectively, this uh, Gaussian kernel, usage of this Gaussian kernel and this similarity function uh, actually is defining uh, a probability distribution. So the similarity values that are being computed in the input space we can interpret them as uh, probability values for each of the points i. And then also in the output space, which is basically the 2D space, there also we define another similarity function, which is denoted as qyj. And uh, this particular situation, in case of the original algorithm, it was also using a Gaussian kernel, the stochastic neighborhood embedding, but uh, there was some problems associated with using Gaussian kernel in that case. So the TSNI algorithm actually extended that idea to include a heavy tail T distribution. And the main purpose of this to uh, actually make it more robust. So usage of Gaussian kernel, it was actually non-robust to outliers, whereas when um, people use this heavy tail T distribution, uh, it became much more robust to different outliers. So again this t distribution and this is from where the t SNE, t of the t SNE is coming from so now we have two different similarity functions that have been computed in both input space and the output space and this can also be interpreted as uh, the probability distributions two different probability distributions now the goal is to actually minimize the kullback leibler divergence between these two distributions and that is performed using a gradient descent algorithm. So we are going to see that um, uh, the scale divergence basically is minimized so that uh, the points that are actually close in the or there are points that are nearest neighbor in the high dimensional space also becomes uh, nearest neighbor in the lower dimensional or the 2D space. So this is the overall idea of the algorithm. So how do we calculate the similarity in the input space? So again, the non-symmetric uh, uh, similarity function for point J to point I, it is actually being modeled by a Gaussian kernel function as uh, you can see in this particular uh, equation over here. And you can see that this is also a directional similarity. So P of uh, J given I will not be the same as pre uh, probability of I given J. So these are like conditional probabilities, uh, uh, essentially uh, these similarity functions. And this similarity function is actually defining for every given point i. So we are trying to compute the similarity of point j to point i. And if we compute that for all the possible points, uh, then it will actually define a probability distribution over all the points which is uh, non-i. Uh, non so all the uh, probabilities of i given i, these are actually set to zero. So then we have ended up with a similarity function, which is also uh, defining a probability distribution. Now, how do we choose uh, the kernel width? So you see for each of these points, the width of the kernel is uh, parameterized as sigma i. So it is basically varying from one point to another right so this is also another important uh, property of the uh, similarity computation in the input space that we are going to choose a different value for the width of the gaussian kernel so the rough idea is to choose this uh, kernel width in such a way that the data point is actually reasonably similar to a predefined fixed number of neighbors so this is somewhat like uh, uh, the parameter k in the k nearest neighbor methods so essentially in this case we are trying to uh, compute uh, the probability distribution so that is where in the next slide we are going to see that uh, the perplexity parameter will be used for defining this value of sigma i okay so um, again as i said earlier so the 
we want to choose sigma i in such a way that the data point i is reasonably similar to a predefined set of uh, neighbors. And this predefined fixed number is actually given by the perplexity of the data or the perplexity of the algorithm that we are going to set. So again, perplexity, the term uh, again basically is referring to or it's playing the same role of uh, sort of like the number of neighbors. So how do we compute perplexity? So we know that uh, we have computed that uh, similarity values, right? So using those similarity values, we can compute the entropy of the current input distribution at point i, right? So uh, essentially this is uh, the entropy values. And then the perplexity can be computed as uh, 2 to the power the entropy. So essentially, again, perplexity is uh, playing the same role as the number of neighbors would play, or uh, the value of k would play in uh, k nearest neighbor, al neighbor algorithms. So similarly, perplexity is playing that same role. And in fact, we want to choose the parameter sigma i, right? Uh, again, as I said earlier, that we want to choose the parameter sigma i such that the perplexity actually matches the pre-specified value. Now imagine that we can already specify the perplexity value to 30, 50, 100, something like that. In fact, the original paper suggested uh, a particular range for the perplexity value. So if you fix that value from the very beginning, then we can easily determine the uh, parameter sigma i of the Gaussian kernel. So essentially, um, <clears throat> This is how the perplexity parameter actually plays the role in finding the or defining the width of the kernel Gaussian kernel function uh, for the input space. And in fact, uh, if we increase the value of the perplexity, so that is actually referring to also increasing the um, variance of the kernel function. So higher the perplexity, higher is the variance of the kernel. And the maximum value of perplexity is n minus 1 which is where n is the number of uh, points. So essentially you can see that uh, uh, since perplexity is playing the role of the number of neighbors, a single point can have number of neighbors is equal to n minus one, where it is basically connected to all the other points. And if that happens, if the perplexity value is n minus one, then the variance of the kernel is actually infinite. And that was actually denoting an, uh, a uniform probability distribution of the points, okay? So for any given perplexity value, so when we have already fixed the value of the perplexity, um, so, but uh, imagine that we are computing this PJI value for all the cells or all the other points. So, other than the nearest neighbors of the point i, which is again uh, on the order of p or the perplexity, uh, the other quantities, uh, other points will contribute a very small probability value in the distribution. So their, their values will be very close to zero in this uh, conditional distribution. The, the similarity function, the similarity value will be very, very close to zero for the points which are not the nearest neighbors of point i. So then, in case of t this is actually um, considering symmetric version of the stochastic neighborhood embedding problem. So instead of directional similarities, it actually defines undirectional similarities, which is which are basically joint probabilities of Pij. Uh, so essentially, the joint probabilities Pij is computed as just this. So it is again average, uh, uh, or basically. Uh, we sum up the values of p of um, i given j and p of j given i and we divide it by 2 and the, uh, normalize by the number of data points. So by doing so, we are actually essentially representing these joint probabilities uh, uh, distributions. So if we uh, sum over all the possible pairs of points, then uh, the sum will be 1. And this becomes a valid probability distribution on a set of all pairs of points, right? So that is what is happening over here. And by defining this symmetric uh, stochastic neighborhood embedding or by defining these joint probabilities, each data point can make a significant contribution to the cost function. 
otherwise uh, this is not possible in the uh, directional similarity computation or the uh, asymmetric uh, SNE problem or the uh, original stochastic neighborhood embedding. Now we also have to define the similarity in the output space and there the similarity values are actually modeled um, using a heavy tail tree distribution. So as I said earlier that in the original algorithm which came up uh, with the idea of stochastic neighborhood embedding, the similarity in the uh, output space was also being calculated using a Gaussian kernel but that was ro not robust to outliers. So outliers could actually distort the, uh, those similarity values. Whereas uh, usage of this heavy tail tree distribution is uh, making it robust to outliers. So this is what uh, the uh, similarity computation looks like in the output space. So again QIJ is uh, a joint distribution on the pairs, uh, any pair i and j and that is basically proportional to another weight value which is computed using this uh, Cauchy dis like distribution which is basically the heavy tailed T distribution. So it is inversely proportional to the distance of the two points y i and y j in the lower dimensional space. All right. So the weight of the uh, weight associated with q y j or uh, that is actually proportional to uh, inversely proportional to the distance uh, the square distance between y and y i and y j. And uh, Z is basically a normalizing constant which where uh, we are just summing up over all the possible values of pairs other than um, uh, the same uh, point being considered twice. So essentially uh, all possible pairs are being uh, considered in this particular summation. So again yi these are the low dimensional coordinates and we set uh, qyi values to 0 and there is uh, no other parameter that we need to tune over here at least in the vanilla version of the TSNE algorithm. So in the output space there is no parameter that we want to tune uh, but uh, in the input space we saw that perplexity was one of the most important parameters that we had to tune. Now the goal is to organize the points in the low dimensional 2D space in such a way that the similarities in the low dimensional uh, space which is denoted as qyj between two points i and j uh, is uh, very close uh, as close as possible to the similarity value pij in the high dimensional space and this is achieved by minimizing the kl divergence or the kullback leibniz divergence which is given by this particular equation right so if we actually expand uh, this equation out then we get a constant which is again pij log pij that part is constant so there is no change and then we are also left with this particular term right and we can further expand it more and by expanding uh, it more even more we end up with two different terms so essentially we want to minimize this um, kl divergence so this is a negative term and this is another term so we want the quantity this quantity to be as large as possible right so if we want to make this quantity as large as possible that means the wij value should be as high as possible so that will overall minimize the kl divergence and for wij to be as high as possible since they are also inversely proportional to the distance square distance between y and and yj so yi and, yi and yj they must be uh, much um, as small as possible in order to maximize this quantity. Uh, so basically you see this term over here is playing the part of an uh, attractive force between two points whenever uh, there is non-zero value of pij. So basically if pij values are non-zero and they are their values will be higher if they are nearest neighbor in the high dimensional data space. So for those points which are actually nearest neighbor of each other, there will be an attractive force uh, working in this uh, KL divergence uh, loss function or the cost function. And the second term is basically also uh, consisting of uh, some uh, log sum of all the weights. 
Now we want to minimize this quantity to minimize the KL divergence. So basically, uh, these again these weight values are also inversely proportional, and we want to minimize them. So basically, this is hinting at a larger distance between uh, any two points i and j. So effectively, this is uh, this can be thought of as a repulsive force between the points i and j, independent of the value of pij, right? So we see that uh, there is a combination of this uh, attractive and repulsive forces in our cost function. And this cost function is minimized using a gradient descent algorithm. So now that we have seen the algorithm of Tisney itself, uh, there has been some theoretical results which basically show that if there is a ground truth clustering uh, consisting of uh, spherical clusters where basically this Gaussian assumption is uh, holding true, then uh, and they have to be also very well separated from each other then a variant of Tisney has a very high likelihood of finding it and this sort of theoretical results have been proven uh, in subsequent studies and you can see uh, such an effect over here also where uh, the Tisney output is very similar to the known ground truth okay. However, uh, as we mentioned earlier that uh, uh, the Tisney has some parameters that we can tune. Uh, so how we tune these different parameters is actually very, very critical. So this, um, uh, some of these parameters or some of these, uh, some of the ways that we can use to improve the um, result of Tisney algorithm are uh, some of these like we can uh, either go for multi-scale uh, similarities, uh, some interesting initialization for PCA instead of uh, initializing the points randomly, excuse me. And uh, also uh, tuning the learning rate can also help in some cases. So in this particular paper uh, from which I have taken this uh, example figure, they first used the vanilla Tisney on the RNA-seq data, single cell RNA-seq data set and they computed these three different measures of uh, local and global properties and then they actually uh, done some of these uh, parameter tuning. So for example, when they set uh, the perplex, when they actually played with the perplexity value, they op observed that uh, the local structure preserving metric uh, the value of that it was decreasing but uh, basically both the global properties were improved and then by applying the PCA initialization uh, they could actually come to a point where uh, both uh, local and uh, global properties were improved as compared to the vanilla Tisney and uh, finally by combining all of this together this multi-scale similarity and PCA initialization and high learning rate, uh, they can actually obtain a uh, better result with respect to the uh, all these three metrics. And you can see that uh, how this particular result looks different as compared to the result of the vanilla Tisney. So uh, with different parameter initialization and uh, with a different initialization and parameter tuning, uh, you can obtain uh, the visualization which is uh, different from the vanilla version. So we can already see that uh, how the parameter tuning is a critical factor for getting the result uh, of, out of Tisney. And this is another example where basically, again, it was a very, very large data set. And for large data set, um, Tisney has shown some particular difficulty in separating the clusters from each other, as you can see over here. So in this case, uh, even though individual clusters were separated, but they uh, could not be separated based on their uh, some biological properties. And in fact, uh, with better initialization and better learning rate, uh, they actually obtained a different um, uh, visualization of the clusters. And in this different visualization, cluster, uh, visualization of the clusters, they were uh, able to separate the developmental trajectories right and even inside a single trajectory um, uh, the order of the developmental order was uh, sort of meaningful so for example uh, as you can see over here 
like all these clusters are in the valina version of the tsni all these clusters are completely jumbled together so it's very difficult to identify any of the different uh, developmental trajectory from this particular uh, visualization but they were much more separated in this particular visualization so again this is hinting that uh, choice of parameters is very very critical for tsni and here in this particular example you can see how the choice of parameters can make difference in your tsni uh, output so again the first figure is uh, using uh, or showing the results of uh, using different values of perplexity so here you have uh, the original data so basically two clusters so as the perplexity values are uh, value is increasing you see uh, two clusters being separated and around this range like 30 50 so uh, the clusters are well separated but if you go beyond that value then again there is uh, the clusters get mixed so as you can see that this perplexity value is an important factor of course uh, very lower perplexity can also separate them somehow like even perplexity 5 they are getting separated but you can imagine that this is a very simple data set consisting of just two clusters so this range of values like 30 to 50 uh, in this particular range uh, the result is sort of the best whereas increasing the perplexity value can again distort the geometry of the data and this next figure is actually showing you the result after using different values of early stropping so number of steps uh, for which the gradient descent is applied so again you can see that all these cases all these uh, situations the perplexity value remains same it is 30 but number of steps are actually changing and based on that the cluster sizes are also changing so uh, um, that's how the visualization is also changing uh, with a different number of steps that are being applied in the algorithm now let us see how we can actually interpret uh, the plots or the 2d plots of tsni so it turns out the size of the clusters uh, so which is uh, again referring to the bounding box measurements or sort of the variance that we observe inside a cluster uh, in a tsni plot the cluster sizes actually do not mean anything so this is an example where uh, two Gaussian distributions or uh, data set coming from a Gaussian mixture of two components uh, is uh, actually our original data and you see this blue cluster is much more dispersed uh, almost 10 times as dispersed as the yellow cluster or the orange cluster and after increasing the perplexity values uh, we observe yes definitely the uh, two clusters are being separated but uh, in all the cases uh, the two clusters actually look about the same size now again you can imagine that we are not referring to the number of points as the size here we are referring to the variance or the amount of dispersion that we observe in a particular cluster as the size of the clusters so when you are actually looking into the size of the clusters uh, they actually do not uh, give you the actual size of the clusters uh, in the original data or in the original space so in fact uh, since tsni algorithm actually uses uh, the notion of similarity to regional density variations so, so essentially we are using the similarity uh, we are computing the similarity matrix and we are treating them as probability distributions so it has a tendency to expand the dense clusters and contract the sparse ones so essentially it has a property of evening out the cluster sizes so let us not uh, forget this and um, we should uh, be able to interpret our cluster uh, clusters as it is but uh, we cannot comment on the dispersion of the data just by looking at the cluster sizes in the 2d plot now this uh, another property that uh, that is sort of lost is the distance between the clusters so in some cases distance between the clusters uh, in the 2d plot after the tsni has been applied it may not mean anything so let us take an example in the this original data there are three clusters two clusters are together and one of them is much more uh, distant than the other two so it turns out that when perplexity 50 is uh, used the similar type of structure is preserved but can we just say that uh, this uh, perplexity value is suitable uh, for um, all the other kind of uh, algorithm uh, like uh, data sets or maybe even for the same data sets so it turns out that is not the true case 
a true scenario. So if we increase the number of points in each of the clusters, so you see uh, for the same range of perplexity value, the distance between the cluster is not indicative of the distance between the clusters in the original space. So you see that this global geometry or this global property of the distance between the clusters, it is getting lost. Uh, uh, it is not um, getting expressed in the um, 2D plot. So effectively, uh, we need to fine tune the perplexity value to preserve some of this uh, global geometry. And in fact, uh, there may not be a single perplexity value uh, that will capture distances across all the clusters. So this is another thing to remember when interpreting this uh, Tisney cluster that the distances between the clusters may not mean anything. Then another uh, very interesting and disturbing property of Tisney is that sometimes random noise may not always look ra random. So that is what we are observing for this particular example. So in the original data, it is completely random noise, Gaussian. Whereas this smaller perplexity value, this perplexity value 2 or 5, it is actually showing some dramatic clusters. Of course, these clusters are getting dispersed for higher perplexity values, but uh, when we apply on a very new data set, we have to sort of identify these clumps which are basically nothing but random noise. So this is actually an important part of uh, reading or interpreting the TSNE plots. So if you already know that there are some noise associated with your data, uh, so you may have to uh, look carefully and vary the perplexity value to see if certain clusters which were observed for certain perplexity value, if they are also observed for higher perplexity value or not. So the identification of this random noise clumps is an important part of understanding the, the plots from the TSNE. And then again, finally, uh, so the topology of the data, which is again a very important uh, uh, property of the data that we have seen with different types of dimension reduction algorithms. So TSNE actually may or may not preserve the topology of the data. So in the first example, as you can see that this is basically a containment example where uh, one cluster is contained in the other cluster, inside the other cluster. So around perplexity value 30, that is what is happening. But again, when perplexity is increased to 50, you see the outer cluster, this yellow cluster is uh, becoming a circular one, which is not really true for the input data. And then again, this is another uh, interesting example uh, where basically in a lower perplexity value completely fails to preserve the topology of the data. Perplexity value of around 30 is actually preserving um, the topology and in fact in, during multiple runs uh, this sort of um, topology structure was preserved. So essentially one has to really be careful uh, to play with this uh, different perplexity values to see if uh, the original topology is preserved. So as you can understand that with uh, a very new data set uh, understanding whether the topology has been preserved or not becomes very difficult. So in summary, we have seen uh, a, a widespread use of TSNE algorithm for uh, representing or visualizing the single cell RNA sequencing data. And the reason is that uh, it is incredibly flexible and it can often find a cluster structure where other dimensionality reduction algorithms cannot find any structure. However, the same kind of flexibility makes it also difficult to interpret the TSNE plots. So we cannot actually trust the global geometry properties or the size of the clusters, distance between two clusters. And we also have to be very careful in understanding which clusters are representing nothing but random noise. And we have seen in multiple uh, examples that it is very sensible to the choices of the parameters. So you can actually play with this uh, different types of initialization of the perplexity value run learning rate, uh, etc. until you want to find or what you expect to see in your uh, data set. So with that, I will end the lecture for today. And uh, hopefully you will also need to use TSNE when you are working with single cell RNA sequencing data. And then you can um, keep in mind uh, about all these uh, different um, ways to interpret the data and um, also how to use different uh, parameter tuning to obtain the best result out of TSNE. Thank you.